I'm glad to see a lot of spine surgeons around and because anticoagulation in spine surgery is associated with disastrous complications because of an epidural hematoma. Now, Lokesh, uh, do you remember Virchow's triad? So it's a combination of endothelial injury and abnormal blood flow and hypercoagulability. The classical case of endothelial injury is a myocardial infarction. Abnormal blood flow is atrial fibrillation, and hypercoagulability is protein C and protein S deficiency. What is more relevant of late is the identification of more and more patients with factor V laden deficiency, which is very common in the general population. So in joint arthroplasty, uh, the trauma and spine surgery, the evidence is quite clear. For patients who are at normal risk, go for standard prophylaxis, and patients who are at high risk, go for chemoprophylaxis or enhanced prophylaxis. I'll just go into details. What are these? So we stick to our basic principles. What is established is early mobilization, like uh, arthroscopy, minimally invasive surgery. We get on the patient back to work as soon as possible, the use of thromboembolic disease stockings, and mechanical prophylaxis. And what exact? So we need to go and identify what are the high-risk group where you need to go ahead with chemical prophylaxis. So any history of venous thromboembolism, old age, malignancy, and for spine patients, history of spinal cord injury, obesity, a thoracic level of surgery, more than five fusion segments, and a prolonged duration of surgery, patients who are on hormone replacement therapy and tobacco. And standard prophylaxis, for normal risk patients include, other than the TED, early mobilization includes mechanical compression devices. There's a lot of high quality data to say that mechanical prophylaxis alone or in combination with aspirin is quite a good treatment option for patients who have normal risk. So aspirin is the wonder drug. It has been the wonder drug, but the biggest problem for aspirin is it's too cheap, so no one is interested. None of the big companies are interested to do good quality studies, but there's a lot of high quality data coming up, uh, even in uh, GBG's American, British, every, everywhere, supporting the use of aspirin. Especially it's being used uh, quite commonly for arthroplasty. The other key issue is whether to discontinue aspirin or clopidogrel during the perioperative period. Elective surgery, we have an option, we can discontinue it. But there are certain scenarios where you can continue it perioperatively. For example, geriatric hip trauma. You don't wait for 40, I mean, five days to for your surgery. You just continue. The academy, the American Academy has clear cut evidence-based practice guidelines which say that you continue aspirin or clopilet, don't wait for five days. And also in high high risk patients. Those of a strong history of venous thromboembolism, you have to continue. So this is another high quality data involving close to a lakh patients. Clearly demonstrated that potent anticoagulants does not reduce the overall mortality or the proportion of deaths due to pulmonary embolism. So you can, normal risk patients, you can very well go ahead with your standard prophylaxis, early mobilization, dead stockings, and ankle foot exercises, which is not really, we don't advocate it quite commonly, but all patients should be taught preoperatively to do ankle and foot exercises, and education is also very important. Enhanced prophylaxis, uh, usually the classical one was uh, warfarin, uh, and the other newer ones, including the oral antivagulants, one's daily dosage, rivaroxaban, apixaban. Every day there's a new uh, drug coming up, and the injectable one is low molecular weight heparin or enoxaparin, that's the classical one. Again, so many other brands of deltaparin, similar parin, so many. So they're all good for patients who are at enhanced risk. Those are at high risk for developing venous thrombombolus. In arthroscopic surgery, there is no evidence to say that you need to routinely put them on anticoagulants unless they are high risk. For example, those who are on thrombophilia. Those who have protein C or protein S deficiency, you have to do something because they are at very high risk. Something new is transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation is for the fibula nerve during surgery so that the muscles are kept active and mobile. And the, they have done a good quality level on data to say that tense 
during surgery reduces the incidence of DVT and fatal pulmonary embolism. The Academy has also come up with a Choosing Wisely campaign, especially for joint arthroplasty surgeons. They came with five commandments. One of the commandments was don't use glucosamine for treating your osteoarthritis patients. The other one is avoid using routine post-op duplex scanning in your post-operative period, especially after total knee or total hip, it, unless it is for research purpose. So this is, this is one of the five commandments of the Academy. And what, about, what is the evidence for use of uh, inferior vena cava filters? And the classic use was for when he's uh, contraindicated to undergo chemoprophylaxis or those who have a residual venous thrombolic disease. But the evidence is still inconclusive because there are trials in favor as well as against using of IVC filters. Depends on the surgeon and maybe more and more level one data that's going to be published. Spine surgery, we have a lot of four spine surgeons in this hospital, so it's quite interesting to debate on it. So again, patients who have normal risk continue with the standard prophylaxis, early mobilization, exercises, mobile compression devices, and even you can use a, there's a high quality data to use a intra-op sterile mobile compression device. There's level one data. There are companies that have a sterile mobile compression device. And the, initia the initiation of treatment is a matter of controversy. I'll come to it again. And there's always, in spine surgery, you have a problem with a risk of epidural hematoma and you need to evacuate or it's like an emergency. The principles are the same. Early mobilization, dead stockings, exercises, education. So the North American Spine Society, spine surgeons are always obsessed with the NAS guidelines. Follow the same standard prophylaxis, and they have emphasized the importance of aspirin, but unfortunately the NAS has not updated the guidelines of late, so it's still pending. So I'm sure with the addition of a lot of studies from arthroplasty and more and more spine studies, aspirin is going to take an important role in spine surgery. So the duration has always been uh, a matter of controversy. Again, it's we, uh, we go according to a normal risk and high risk. In normal risk, you can continue for 10 days, and those at high risk, 35 days is the standard advice that is you give for two weeks injectable or 10 days injectable and then convert to oral. And those who have an established previous history of venous thrombolism, they may need to take it for a very long time, especially a lot of patients on WAF for 12 or 18 months. So the initiation of therapy in spine surgery is a matter of debate when to start anticoagulation, especially for high-risk patients. So it is important to understand the coagulation cascade starts at the time of surgery. So you need to start it a day prior. But there's no head-on-head head trial to say that starting prior and starting a day later makes any difference. So the NAS still continues with initiation of anticoagulation 24 to 48 hours later. Thank you all for your patient listening. Thank you very much for this very informative uh, talk. Any questions?